Hey, I'm Pastor Bob, lead pastor of Lighthouse Church. No matter what's going on in life, I believe through this practical message, you will find hope, help, and healing for your everyday life. Before we get started, I want to, I want to start with a story. And this happened back in 2016. I was driving down Veterans Boulevard in, in Hendersonville as I was coming from I, I, I was coming from Nashville headed toward Hendersonville and I was driving down 386 and, and it was about 11 o'clock in the morning and at, at this time at 11 o'clock in the morning I'll, I'll never forget it I, I had this impression in my heart to call somebody. Now how many of you have ever had an impression in your heart to call somebody? And you didn't do it. Anybody ever be there? Anybody ever have that moment? So, so the day goes on. And about 11.30, quarter to 12, I have another impression to call this person. And I didn't do it. So I'm visiting some families. I'm doing some things out in Hendersonville. I can't remember exactly what the day was. If I went back into my calendar, now I calendarize everything, so I could probably tell you the day and the time. But I was, but I, but about one o'clock that afternoon, I got that impression again, and I said, "Fine." How many of you get exasperated with the Holy Spirit sometimes? So I pick up the phone and I call Chris. His name was Chris Cooper. And I called Chris, and I, Chris and I had been friends when I had pastored at Cornerstone years earlier. He'd gone through a, you know, he'd, he'd never been married, but just struggled with some things, and we became close friends. I came back to Cornerstone, and we rekindled that relationship. And in the meantime, while I was gone, he had gotten married. So I, I call Chris, and Chris doesn't answer. So I leave a voicemail. I said, hey, Chris, it's Pastor Bob. I have no idea what's going on in your life right now. But I wanted to let you know, Holy Spirit has had you on my heart all day, and I just wanted to say, hey. Now, this is a fellow, we'd go have lunch maybe once every two or three months, something like that, and just shoot the breeze and of, of, no, of no significance or, or success. So I lay that out there. No phone call back. How many of you know sometimes you leave a message, and a message like that's kind of nebulous anyway. It doesn't require anything. It doesn't require a phone call back. It just is saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. I get a call about 4.30 that afternoon. And Chris had a massive heart attack and died about 11.30 that morning. How many of you have ever had that, that, that impression of guilt that I wasn't obedient? I didn't listen. God, could I have done something? Do, do you know what I mean? Because the first impression happened before he died. Something was going, and then all of a sudden the shame of not being obedient settled in. And you know what? There are things like that that happen. I remember as a little boy, when my dad died, I was talking just earlier about my testimony about my, boy, my dad dying. I had been sick on the Monday, and so on that Tuesday, on that Tuesday morning when I woke up, my dad didn't let me go skiing with him. And so as a 10-year-old, every, every Monday night, I got to go skiing with my dad. And, and so I was mad at my dad, and I was ignoring my dad. I ignored my dad at breakfast, didn't talk to him, and he kept saying, Bobby, we'll go skiing on Friday. We always go on Mondays and Fridays. It's going to be fine. And I just kind of did that. Like, is somebody talking? 1.30 that afternoon, my, my dad was killed. How many of you know I dealt with guilt? And I dealt with shame for treating my dad the way that I did. We all deal with guilt and shame at different levels and in different ways. And it's weird how guilt and shame show themselves in our lives. In the next few minutes, I, I know that we've been talking over the, 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 the last several weeks about these things called silent killers. And, and we've talked about complacency and, and, and compromise. We've talked about bitterness and anger. And we've talked about the level of unforgiveness that sometimes those things bring. We, we've talked a little bit about worry and fear. And so this morning, I, I just want to lay before you guilt. And I want to lay before you shame. 
See, in context, before I want to proceed into this guilt and, 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 and shame, the topic of this week, over the, the past several weeks, I've, I've kind of been processing some thoughts in my mind, and, and, these mind and, the, and, and they all start with this question, why? Why do Christians struggle with complacency? Why do Christians struggle with anger? Why do they struggle with unforgiveness? Why do they struggle with worry? Why do they struggle with fear? Why do they struggle with guilt? And even shame. Why are not we are the ones that have been given the word of God, and this word of God is to set us free? And why aren't we free? We, we, we understand why why do we why do we why why do we give them so much freedom to live unchecked in our lives? Why do we let these things have their own life in us? Why do, we, why do we simply let them go? Simon Sinek, I read this book. I'm, uh, I read this book uh, by, uh, by Simon Sinek, and it's called Start With Why. And in this book, Start With Why, it challenged me. And, and it's often, he implies in his writings, he says this, is that we tend to ask the wrong questions, make the wrong assumptions, and limit our understanding. If Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 36, if Jesus really did say, if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. But why aren't we? Can I ask you that question? Is it fair to ask? In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is talking again. And he says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and to destroy but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments, I just ask right now, Lord, that you'd allow my tongue to be that of a ready writer. I just ask right now, Lord, that we would experience freedom, freedom from the silent killers that control our lives. All of us have them, whether we're willing to admit them or not. But God, I pray right now, Father, that we would be free in Jesus' name. Amen. See, 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 these kinds of scriptures, when I think about these scriptures, they, they are energizing. They are exciting. They are, they, are, they are scriptures that we can get behind and go, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, I'm free. We sing songs about it. We embark upon this journey and it takes us on this journey of freedom because the pastor said so and he said I can have it, but nothing happens. Why? Why? Now, I don't know about you, but, 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 but in my life, I, I have to come to this truth that in this word, there is an answer for me. There is a solution for me. I have to believe that. Otherwise, there's no business me standing up here in front of you. You know, Pastor Barry and I understand that every week we can have stuff going on in our life, but yet we have to be ready to release a message so that it sets you free, even though we might not be free ourselves. Is that too transparent? Is that too honest? It, it, there's, there are some things that, that we all are walking through in our own lives, but at the same time, we, we shouldn't be surprised that the why is difficult to answer. Go with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy. I found this to be an interesting passage of Scripture, and this is going to be the one that I'm going to launch you hopefully into. We've, been, we've all been here before. And we, we seem to circle this same mountain over and over again. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse number 2. I love this passage of Scripture. Now, if you've never studied the book of Deuteronomy, I'll, I'm giving you time. I hear pages still turning. If you've never been to Deuteronomy before, Deuteronomy is, is, this, is this book and it's, and it's the preparation for, for the children of Israel to leave uh, to, to, to leave the wilderness and go into the promised land, okay? So it's kind of written in three parts. There's, there's three parts to it. They're basically three sermons preached by Moses, okay? And so, so this, is, this is the beginning of sermon number one, okay? So, so out, of this, out of this message, he says, normally it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai 
to Kadesh Barnea, going by way of Mount Seir. Okay? But 40 years after the Israelites left Egypt, On the first day of the 11th month, Moses addressed the people of Israel, telling them everything the Lord had commanded him to say. This took place after he had defeated King uh, Sihon, uh, uh, the Amorites, and ruled in Heshbon. And the Edril had defeated King Og of Bashan. And sometimes people get messed up with all those words, and I just say that guy in that place, okay? So, so, so. Who, who, I, you know, I realize we're all on different levels in our walk with God. So guess what? Some of us don't know how to read those things. And we just go, yeah, that guy. <laughs> you know, so, so here we are with those guys and, and, and those places who ruled. It says, while the Israelites were in the land of Moab, east of the Jordan River, Moses carefully explained the Lord's instructions as follows. When we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, You have stayed at this mountain long enough. What was supposed to be something that passed through in 11 days, what was supposed to only take 11 days, took 40 years. Now, now can I talk to the church for just a minute? I, my heart burdens for the church because, because I know that there are some of us that are in this room that what was supposed to take a day or two was supposed to take two or three days, maybe took 11 days. Maybe I'll give you a month, you know. But some of us are still walking in things that are 20 and 30 and 40 years later. And God finally said to Moses, it's time to break camp and move on. You've been here long enough. You've been in this place of wilderness. You've been in this place of pain. You've been in this place of allowing those silent killers to have their place in your life. And let me just command or commission you this morning. You know what? It's time to break camp and let's move on. It's time to say no more should we be dealing with these things. You've stayed at this mountain. You've stayed at this crossroads. You've stayed at this difficult point in your life. Life. You've stayed in this fear. You've stayed in this pain. You've stayed in this worry. You've stayed in this doubt. You've stayed in this complacency. And it's time to break camp at that mountain. And it's time to move on. The challenge is, is how do I move on? How do I move on? When I look at moving on, I realize there are things that keep me from moving forward. Guilt and shame are one of those things that keep me from moving forward. See, guilt and shame are the emotions when we leave them unchecked in our lives. They can cripple our spiritual walk, leaving us feel unworthy of God's grace, stuck in a cycle of circling that mountain of regret, circling that mountain of shame, circling that mountain of of guilt repeatedly. If you've ever said words like this, I wish I had never. I wish I had never done that. I wish I'd never said that. I wish I'd never. Those are just moments and words of recollection that if you're not careful, those words can become the controller and the campsite by which you stay, whether you stay there for the 11-day duration or you stay there for 40 years. See, God wants us to move forward. We have to move past this wilderness mentality and and, and get stuck in that mindset of why am I stuck here? Can you imagine over the 40 years, those children of Israel constantly saying, oh, when are we going to get done with this mountain? When are we going to get to see it? When are we going to get to go? And we know the reason. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe later. But the truth of the matter is, what should have taken 11 days to get past took 40 years And God still had to tell them, enough is enough. Guys, I I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know the burdens or the pains that you're carrying. I don't know the weights and the hindrances that are holding you back. But they never get resolved. So many people, so many people, we, we believe in grace. But we choose to remain in guilt. We, we accept salvation while succumbing to shame. 
See, so one of the things that I've learned and know and understand is that we've all made mistakes. The Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. Praise the Lord, we have 1 John 1, 9 that says if we freely admit that we've sinned, the Bible says that we have found God utterly reliable and straightforward. He forgives our sins and makes us thoroughly clean. But there's a thing called guilt and shame that somehow battle that freedom all the time. I, I got the grace of God, but I'm still walking in guilt. I'm, I've, I've received salvation, but man, I'm still ashamed. But can I say your sin is not your name? That's not your name. That's not who you are. Your mistake is not who you are. But we identify by those mistakes. We identify by our failures. We can have right or wrong mindsets. Let me just give you a few because I'm watching my time today. Moses, can you imagine not just the children of Israel, but Moses killing the Egyptian, personal insecurities, getting angry at rocks. I mean, some of you will get that in a minute. But, 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 but he, he, got mad at, he got mad at people, smacked a rock, and as a result, it prevented him from receiving the blessing of God. Peter had a brash personality. He liked to cut off ears and deny Jesus. But he became one of the most powerful people in the New Testament in terms of ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. How about Paul? He wasn't just a killer of Christians, but he was, he was a killer of one of them that was identified by name, and his name was Stephen. Can you imagine the guilt and the shame that must have come along with those things? Every time he heard somebody talk about Stephen, can you imagine with me where his mind might have gone? I wish I would have, should have, could have. Oh, I wish that never ever happened. I wish I'd never, you know what? I never should have let them drop those cloaks at my feet. I never should have allowed that to take place. I never should have asked for permission from the, the, from the, from the leadership to, to allow me to do that. Can you imagine the things that he walked through on a daily basis? Guys, you may not have that level of guilt or shame, but you might have some semblance of guilt or shame. I wish that marriage would have worked out. I, I, I wish my kids, I got them in church sooner. I, I, wish, I, I wish I hadn't allowed my family to watch that or I bought that or I went there or I did this. And we look back at moments. We look back at, 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 at moments where we cross the line and we say to ourselves, I wish I had not done that. Can you imagine Rahab being a prostitute and saying to herself, oh, I wish I hadn't lived that lifestyle. But you know what? She is in the lineage of Jesus. How about, how about Jacob? He was known as a deceiver. We heard about that last week. See, when, when we battle guilt and shame at some point, all of us have dealt with it. And sometimes the feelings uh, are a natural consequence of a transgression. Did you know that having some semblance of guilt and some semblance of shame is what drives people to the altar? Knowing that I can't fix this on my own. I can't repent. I, I can't be clean enough without the help of a father. I can't help. I can't do it without the help of a savior. But, but what happens, though, is we come into this place, unfortunately, we allow the feelings of guilt and shame to take different places in our lives. I want to talk to you. We've talked a little bit about Moses and Peter and Paul and Jacob, but I want you to go with me to 2 Samuel. Take a moment and go to 2 Samuel. It's in the, it's in the Old Testament. For all of my kids that are that are that are that we're doing we're doing sword drills in youth, I, I want to encourage them because Second Samuel comes after First Samuel. Just so y'all know, <laughs> just thought I'd let you know that just in case. All right, you know, you got to get it pretty early to get by me, you know. But I was thinking about this story. Not because of the levelty or the brevity of sin, but the reality and the understanding that we all can find guilt and shame in some things. The Bible tells us in this story of David, it says, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Reban, Reba. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Keep going. 
It says, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed, and he was walking on the roof of his palace, and he was just kind of checking out the city and everything, and he looked over the city wall, and he noticed a woman, unusually beautiful, taking a bath. Now, now, now we know the rest of the story without going into the details of that story, the gore of that story, the, 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 the difficulties of that story. What we know is, is we know this, that, 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 that David sinned with Bathsheba, committed adultery. And not only did he commit adultery, but he tried to cover it up by, by, by making it look like it was Uriah's child that she was birthed with, birthing. And, and, and as a result, sends off Uriah to have him killed in war, and then he'd be the hero, come in, swoop on, take care of her, and love on her, and take care of her, and do all those kinds of things. But I was thinking about this story. Can you imagine David's life at some point saying, man, I wish I had just gone to war like I was supposed to? I wish I had just, I wish I had done what kings are supposed to do that day. I wouldn't have gotten myself into trouble. And, and, and oftentimes that's how things start, is that we're not paying attention or doing the things that we ought to be doing. And as a result, guilt and shame has a transgression attachment to it that we look at it and we say, man, I wish I wasn't doing that when that happened. I wish, I, how many of you wish, I wish I would have been there for Chris Cooper to answer that phone call. I wish I would have been different with my father that morning that he died. There's things that I look back on and I wish I would have, should have, could have. And the guilt and the shame is so real. But the guilt and the shame is often harder when we know better. There's, it's one thing if we didn't know any better. It's one thing if, you know, we innocently made a mistake. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. You know, some way, that, those are easier. But when we know better, David knew better. David knew better. And because David knew better, the depth of his guilt, the depth of his sin was so amazing. And so there's four things this morning that I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to do them with you quickly but I hope I can articulate with you some understanding. Number one is this. Number one, there are varying weights of guilt and shame. We just have to understand that. There's varying weights of guilt and shame. You know, David serves as a powerful example who wrestled deeply with his guilt and shame. We know that by looking at Psalms 51. Psalms 51 says this. Look at what it says. It says, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Next verse, it says, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. I mean, the weight of that sin, the weight of that guilt, the weight of that shame. He, he's crying out to God in Psalms 51. But guilt and shame often begin and manifest as internal accusations and condemnations. We, they don't start outside, you should have. They start out, I wish I had. Most of the time, I don't need you to po show, show me my, 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 my guilt and my shame. Most of the time, the guilt and... How many of you... I, I've, I've gotten done with sermons that, that I thought, man, that one didn't. That one fell like a lead balloon. You know, that one just was terrible. And I, I'm beating myself up before anybody else has to walk up and say, well, that pastor, that wasn't your best. You, you understand what I'm saying? I don't need somebody else to tell me. Most of the time, the guilt and the shame that I have, if I'm off with somebody, most of the time, I don't need somebody else to come tell me, hey, did you know that you're, you're, at, you're at odds with so-and-so? I know in my own heart that, I, that I'm at odds with somebody. I know in my own heart that something's not right. I, I know already what's going on. But there's two types of guilt that we look at as I've studied this week. There's legal guilt, and then there's also what we call theological guilt. Legal guilt is this. Guess what? I'm driving down the road, and I see a little blue light that goes on behind me. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm speeding. That's an easy answer for all the use in the room. But guess what? That's a legal guilt. Oh, man, I got caught. Right? It doesn't change really the way that we drive much. But, we, but, but, the, but there's little things that are what we would call legal guilt. But then there's the theological guilt. Did you know that's the guilt? That's a transgression against God. That's a transgression that when we transgress against God, there's some weight that comes with that. You know, while guilt and shame has their way, the weight of sin remains a stronghold. When that failure of 20 years ago, I wish, oh, the guilt of that marriage that now affects my kids that fell apart. And, and all of a sudden we start reliving that. What we're doing is we're rehashing the sin and the failure of what happened yesterday as if it happened today. Guilt and shame have a wonderful way 
of making us think about what happened before again and again and again and again. It causes us to think things like that. I was reading in a couple of books as I was studying this week, Neil, Neil Anderson in his book, Grace, the, uh, Grace the, the, That Breaks the Chains, it says this, guilt is the conviction of, uh, guilt is the conviction of what, that we've done something wrong, where shame is the belief that we are something wrong. I'm never going to mount anything. Because of what happened, that took place. And I, I, I see it, I see it so often in the church. We've moved past this thing that I've done something wrong to believe that I am something wrong. There's something wrong with me. There's something deeply wrong with me. And there's, you know, that's the place that the enemy gets his ownership of you. See, I, I think about it this way. Dr. Sandra Wilson in her books, book, Released from Shame, said this. Shame is different than guilt. Guilt tells me that I made a mistake. Shame shouts me that I am a mistake. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake, church. I, I think about David in his realization and his confession of his sin. And he made this statement in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. It's just one page over from 2 Samuel chapter 11. But it says this, Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord, by doing this, your child will die. Did you know that there's always a consequence for sin? The Bible says that what we sow, we reap. And we have to understand that there is, there is a reciprocating factor that I've made a mistake, but the mistake doesn't necessarily mean that it's me. It's something that I failed at. You've all failed at something. I, you, can, you define what your failure is. You define what your mistake is. You define where you fell short, but that's not who you are. I love the fact that when I think about guilt and shame, it's like a backpack, and I keep, I keep filling it up with bricks and rocks and bricks and rocks, and we were talking and running about you in the youth today, and, and I was thinking to myself, man, I, I would never want to have a backpack filled with bricks and rocks as I'm running, but that's how we tend to live our life, our Christian lives. We got bricks and rocks in this backpack, and, and, and I had an illustration. The backpack's in my car, but the last time we did a church cleanup, we threw away all of our bricks, and so I went looking for bricks, and I couldn't find any. So my illustration went, I had no bricks to fill my backpack. But guilt and shame don't just weigh us down. They silence us. So not only are there varying elements uh, or varying types of guilt and shame, but the second thing I want you to understand is that guilt and shame have the power to silence us. You know, if I'm carrying that backpack with all the guilt and the shame in that, you know what? I don't want anybody to notice it, so I don't talk about it. Uh, people might notice. They might see it. They may or may not. But what I found is in Psalms, David makes another declaration. He, he's trying to get things right, and, 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 but th this is a, he says, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Did you know that the Bible says, he, oh, let me keep reading, it says, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Here we are dealing with a gentleman who said he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't say anything. But the Bible says that we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb is Jesus Christ. He did what he's going to do. But at some point, we've got to come to a place, guys, where our words match what he did. Our words have to accommodate what he's done in our lives. See, I think about this, we, we get silent, and Adam and Eve got silent, didn't they? When guilt and shame come into their life, they got silent. What did they do? They, were, they hid themselves. They didn't even want to be seen by God. And the day before, just the day before, God had walked with them in the cool of the day. And I love this. It's so funny to me. God was saying, hey, Adam, hey, Eve, where are you? Duh. You know where everything is. You know where everyone is. Guess what? He's just recognized recognizing. They hid from the Lord and they covered themselves. So besides David, we find that Peter, we, he, he retreated from his calling as a disciple. After he cut the ear off, after he denied Christ, what do we find and what do we know? He went back to fishing. 
And Jesus had to come to him in that moment when he's like, you know what? Jesus is gone. I'm going fishing. And Jesus goes and prepares a meal for him. Sits on the bank and waits for him to come back. Can you just imagine? You know, he's thinking all these thoughts. I denied my Savior. I denied the Lord. You know what? He's not here. And, and there's a guy sitting on the beach cooking him a meal saying, you know what? I love you enough to cook for you. I know what you did. But come and eat with me. Jonah dealt with isolation. The prodigal son, he woke up in the pig pen. There are things that will happen that guilt and shame, they thrive on silence. When we hide our feelings, when we allow guilt to develop into shame and to grow and to flourish, it makes us even more isolated in our lives. See, we can have guilt and shame in our marriages. We can have guilt and shame in our relationship with our kids. We, we can have guilt. There's, there's moments that I said to my older than my younger, I wish I had done it differently like we did it with you. How many of you know, how many first kids in the room? Any first kids in the room? You're a first kid. You're a first kid. How many of you know you were just the experiment for your parents? <laughs> can I get an amen, Pastor Barry? We realized how much our younger siblings got away with. But we were just the experiment. And my, my mom and dad have said, Bob, I wish we would have done it differently for you. I was in a different high school and a different school. This is my life. From third grade to graduation of high school, I was in a different school every year. Every year, different school. I told my parents on my day of graduation, don't do this to my brothers and sisters. Let them graduate in one school. And they never moved. They kept the kids in school. They all had the... But you know what? I was the experiment. My parents were just trying their best. But, but you know what? They can have guilt and shame over messing up my life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, the, but the isolation or this separation, this loneliness and exile of guilt and shame will keep us from getting the help. Because oftentimes this is what happens. We don't want to be found out. We feel guilt and shame because we have an alcohol problem, a pornography problem. We have guilt or shame because of the fact that we read things and look at things. We go places. We do stuff. We say things. Our mouth isn't pure. Our mouth isn't clean. Things happen. But you know what? Guilt and shame can settle in because what's going to happen? We don't want others to find us out. Who are we really? And what have we done in the pain that we might have caused? The isolation of guilt and shame often screams louder than the original sin. It often screams louder because we make it worse than it originally was. We make it worse. See, when we talk about this isolation, we don't like to talk about our sexual sin or our moral failures. Hey, you know what? I did this and, I did, and I'm not proud of it. We don't like to talk about our addictions from substance or substance abuse. We don't like to talk about past trauma. Why do I talk about the sexual abuse I went through as a 10-year-old boy? Because every time I do, I kick the devil in the teeth. And you know what? It might set someone else free. So past traumas are things that we, that we, that we have a guilt. Now, was I that way my, the minute it happened? No. It took me almost 10 years. Actually, it took me 11 years to finally get help. I was 21 years old when I finally started seeing somebody for help. Because why? I didn't want anybody to know. I didn't want anybody to know. You know what? We, we, see, the, we see the guilt and the shame through, through failure to meet expectations, maybe of ourselves or others. Maybe I didn't measure up to what my wife wanted. Maybe I didn't measure up to what my husband wanted. Maybe I didn't measure up to what my kids wanted. I'm not the best dad in the world, but I sure am trying. Maybe you have regrets over past decisions, maybe, as a parent or a spouse. Maybe, 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 there, maybe you went through a public failure or a scandal, a divorce. A crim maybe, there, maybe, there's a cr maybe there's a crime in your, in your history. Can you imagine the man that preached from this pulpit last week dealing with eight and a half years of living in prison from a murder that he committed when he was 18 years old? The guilt and the shame that every day lives in his life. Maybe there was a spiritual failure. I was believing God, but you know what? God, you failed me and you, you know what? Some of us, some of us won't admit that one. We were believing God to do something and nothing happened. Or it didn't happen the way we wanted it to happen. And as a result, we have a spiritual failure. The Bible calls that shipwrecked. Did you know that you can have a shipwrecked faith? 
See, see, when I'm looking at these things, I, I think of the third one here, and, and we've, only got one, we've only got two more. Number three is this. Number three is this. Guilt and shame have a crippling effect on faith and relationships. So not only, not only does, does it silence us, and it has the ability to silence us, but it has this crippling effect on, on, on my faith and my relationships with others. See, guilt makes me feel unworthy to serve while shame convinces me that I'm fit for community. Guilt says, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, that, 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 that I don't have a right to serve, but, what, but shame convinces me that I'm not even fit for community. I don't even have a right to have the friends that I believe I should have. David made the declaration in Psalms 38 verse 4. He says this, my guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. I'm bent over and racked with pain. All day long I walk around filled with grief. He's just talking about his life. He's talking about how he feels. You know, the, the hard part is, is if we were all like Psalms, if we were all like David, a day he was just supposed to go off to war. I wish I'd gone off to war. I wish I had done what I was supposed to do. But now he's having to unpack all of these feelings that came as a result of wish I woulda, shoulda, coulda. See, guilt and shame affect us in more ways than we want to admit. They create deep emotional and relational wounds. Guilt and shame is, is, is kind of like this rut that we end up walking in and we kind of fall back into. Ever been by a slippery water bank? And, and you're trying to get out and you whoop back in and you try to get out and whoop you're back in. And it, 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 guilt and shame are the same thing. It might not be over the same thing, but it's something that we become accustomed to and part of. I can tell by the talk of people that are walking in guilt and shame. David's guilt caused deep grief in his life. It affects our relationships with others. How many of you know it affected his relationship with Uriah? Had he, been a, had he been right with God, he would have walked up to Uriah and said, I've sinned against you. But he wasn't right with him because he tried to cover it up. So it affects our relationships with others, and it also has dire consequences. It was the loss of his son. But then it also has an impact on our legacy. If I don't deal with guilt and shame, it's, it, it transcends legacy. And what am I talking about? In 2 Samuel, you don't have this, but in chapter 12, verse 11, it says, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. Can I have the worship team come? Can I have the worship team come? Can I say this, that the antidote to guilt and shame is not perfection? but grace. Can I say that one more time? The antidote or the solution to the problem of guilt and shame is not perfection. You're not going to be perfect. Say, I'm not going to be perfect. <laughs> but it's grace. See, when you begin to grasp and understand grace, when you begin to understand and receive grace, number four says this, guilt and shame are silenced only through the freedom of God's grace. You can only silence the noise and the voice of guilt over how you raised your children, over that mistake that you've made, those issues that you walked through and those failures that you participated in. The only way that you get past the guilt and the shame of I wish I had done it this way, I should have done it that way. God, why did you allow that to take place in my life? Is through the freedom of God's grace. And the church has to find that. The church has to find that or we, or we continue to entertain these silent killers of guilt and shame. As I was reading those quotes to you earlier, I found one more quote, and I don't know who said this. But I feel like it is the answer for somebody in the room. That guilt says you made a mistake. Shame says you are the mistake. But grace says you are forgiven. 
Grace says you're forgiven. But you have to accept that forgiveness from the things that you've done. As we get ready to close, I realize this, that David, he, he was confronted by Nathan in Psalms 51, and he, he repented. There was a consequence. But I want you to understand, we jump to the New Testament, and the New Testament gives us an understanding that the problem of guilt and shame has been solved with grace. The Bible says this in 1 John 2. I'm reading out of the message. It says, I write this, dear children, to guide you out of sin. But if anyone does sin, we have, a fr- we have a priest, friend, in the presence of the Father. Jesus Christ, righteous Jesus. When, we, when he served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the problem of sin for good. Not only ours, but the whole world's. So we know that the problem of sin, but did you know that there's a problem of sin that is solved, but then there's the weight of sin? There's a difference between the two. And we look at the weight of sin and the weight of guilt and shame. We are freed by God's grace. At this particular point, it's in my notes. If I had my rock-filled backpack, I would have dropped it on the ground. It actually says that right here, drop backpack. But imagine with me if I really let go of guilt and shame. If I really let go of those rocks and those chains, if I really let go, because the weight of guilt and shame will keep you from walking in the power and the anointing that God has for you. There are some things that God has in you that you don't even know that he put there. And the Bible says in Romans, it says, it says, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Final thought, final thought. We're going to sing a song. Final thought. You cannot be set free from guilt and shame until you allow yourself to have a transformed mind. Your mind has to change. Until you, if you choose to continue thinking the way you're thinking, you won't be set free. Guilt and shame are just simply bondages of the brain. They're bondages in your brain. And you gotta let those go. You, you gotta believe that God has a plan and a destiny for you. You, you've got to believe that what's inside, not the guilt or the shame, controls us. Is that Savior inside of me controlling me? When we release the past, we open up to what God has for us. And we have to understand that God sp- what God says speaks louder than what I've been listening to. What God says is so much louder. Would you stand to your feet? I'm going to have one altar call this morning. But I want to read a scripture before I do. David, David, wish he'd gone off to war probably. And then he never would have gotten himself in trouble with that young lady. But you come to the end of David's life. Maybe you've heard this preached before. Maybe you haven't. But you come to the end of his life, what did David get in trouble for? He was playing with a pretty young thing. The Bible says that we can be free of guilt and shame. Because in 1 Kings, right before David was to go on, King David was now very old. And no matter how many blankets covered him, he could not keep warm. Can anybody relate? Man, my man, I need more blankets. My wife throws them off, I put them on. I don't know what the deal is. Verse 2. So his advisors told him, Let us find a young virgin to wait on you and look after you, my Lord. She will lie in your arms and keep you warm. So they searched throughout the land of Israel for the beautiful girl. And they found Abishai from that place and brought her to the king. Verse 4. The 
girl was very beautiful. And she looked after the king and took care of him. But the king had no sexual relationships with her. You know what? Guilt and shame no longer owned him. He was free. He was free this morning. Would you bow your head? The very thing that caused David's guilt and shame was silenced. Stop allowing guilt and shame to keep you from the experiencing the fullness of God's freedom and His grace. If we truly confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And we can be like David and say things like, Restore me the joy of my salvation and make me willing to obey You. And we look at this, and in order to walk in guilt walk free from guilt and shame we have to make a physical decision that it was no longer going to hold us it's no longer going to bind us we're going to sing a song I'm not going to ask you what you're coming forward for but there's a guilt or there's a shame that you're struggling in and you know it from the minute I started talking about it You wish you shoulda, coulda, woulda. You wish things would be different. You wish you hadn't. You wish you did. And there's something in your life right now that you need to lay at the altar and say, God, no longer am I going to carry that guilt and that shame. It's not going to own me. It's not going to distract me. It's not going to depress me. I'm going to be free from that right now. As they start singing, I want you to come and we're going to pray one final time. Come right now. Come right now. Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Let it go let it go right now. Let it go. Let it go. The altar, the Father's arms are open wide. The Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Was brought Hallelujah. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Your regrets and mistakes. Oh God, we don't have guilt. Come we don't have today, shame. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Hallelujah. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, oh, come to Let's worship, the let's worship altar. Let's worship the, the Lord Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar I 
Christ is risen. What a Savior. What a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? I don't know what it was. I have no idea, and I don't need to know. I, I really don't need to know whether we're in our 90s or whether we're in our 20s. Whether we've made one or we've made a million mistakes. We've got to find grace because grace is the silent killer to the silent killers of guilt and shame. Guilt and shame doesn't define you. It's not who you are. It's not who you are. We can feel bad for a moment, but you know what? Just like God said to the children of Israel, you know what? I think we've gone around this mountain long enough and it's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. We don't need to go around that mountain anymore. What well, should have been 11 days. You know what? It's time. It's time. I want you to let it go. There may have been more in the room that felt their guilt and their shame kept them from coming. But I want you to all pray with us with me, would you? Say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father forgive me that I couldn't trust you enough to take me away from this mountain and God you spoke to me this morning and challenged my heart to leave that guilt and shame one last time I'm not going to pick it up I'm going to change the way I live I'm going to change what I'm doing and I'm going to start acting as if I am really free in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for every person that came forward, every person in this room. As we conclude this service, I'm asking you, Father, I'm asking you, Father, that, that we would kill guilt and shame one more time. God, there's going to be opportunities that the devil is going to use guilt and shame to keep us from stepping into the anointing and the power that God has for us. But God, no more. We're free in Jesus' name. And God, we give you praise. We give you thanks. Now I pray for that one that might be in the room that doesn't know you. Maybe they need to get their heart right with you. Maybe they need to ask for forgiveness. And ask you, Jesus, to become their Lord and Savior or re-invite you into their life again. God, I pray, Lord, that they would do that. But God, today is a day that we're free. And we're free indeed. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know what? You know how we, you know how we, we, we scare guilt and shame? You know how we do that? We scream. We just scream hallelujah, all right? If you're free, you're going to scream it till you, till you, you blow your eardrums or something. You ready? We're going to Scott, we're just going to shout hallelujah as loud as we can. Are you ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday. Don't miss Wednesday night. We'll see you next Sunday. We're talking about pain. We're talking about the, 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 the silent killer of pain. I'll see you next Sunday. Hey, thanks for listening to this message. If you've never accepted Jesus, we want to pray with you. You can contact us at info at lighthousemj.com and we will have one of our team reach out to you. If this message has made an impact on your life, make sure you subscribe, like, and share. 
Hey, and if nobody told you this week that they love you, let me be the first. I love you.